Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, this month's Blurb webinar about portfolios. Uh, I'm going to give everyone a few minutes to sign in here and make sure that you can hear me and see me because uh, every time we do this, it's like landing the lunar module. In theory, that you've done the math, but uh, boy, until it hits the hits that red earth, you're just not entirely sure. So, for everyone out there who can see me and hear me. Will you go into the chat and just tell me <clears throat> where you are chatting in from? Ah, hi everyone, I can see Sam. All right, where are you guys coming in from? San Francisco, Seattle, Charlotte, Michigan, Chicago, South Carolina, Loveland. Wow, we're primarily a American audience this time, although we got a little, we got Canada checking in. Oh, Germany, there we go. I should have, uh, Netherlands, Quebec. Ohio, UK, right on with a lot of different people here. So I'm going to give uh, just a couple minutes before we um, we get started. Then I'm going to introduce our guest. We have a very, very special guest today. As you can see, she's she's right there. But I'm, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna hold out on her her name and description. I'm just going to give you a, my personal uh, description of uh, Julianne. But let me just give one more minute here. Uh, Belgium, LA, Nashville. Paula from New Mexico. Paula, where in New Mexico are you writing in from? Just out of curiosity. I am a part-time New Mexico dweller myself. Uh, we've got Cupertino, Peak District, Albuquerque, ABQ, all right. I will be there next week, actually. Okay, so let's get this, uh, let's get this game started. My name is Dan Milner. I'm the uh, creative evangelist for Blurb. And we have a very special guest today who is uh, Julian Cost from, from uh, Adobe. I'm reading the uh, chat webinar. It's costly. Uh -oh. <laughs> that was pretty good. Witty friends. So Julianne Cost is our guest today. She uh, is with Adobe. And I just want to, I want to set the table here. So I've been around the photography industry for, let's say, somewhere between 25 and 30 years. I've seen a lot of people come and a lot of people go. I've seen some educators. I've seen some good educators, a very few great educators. I've seen a lot of presentations, a lot of lectures, a lot of workshops, some good, some not so good. I have to say that Julianne is one of the best, the most important members of the photo community that I know in the entire time I've been around photography. She's a wonderful resource, but also a really funny person and a great presenter. And actually, every single time I open Lightroom, there is one thing that I do, that the only thing I know how to do in Lightroom I learned from her. So if you want to just give us a, a brief synopsis of, of who you are, what you do, then we can, we'll get rolling after that. Well, um, sure. So hi, everyone. I'm Julianne Koss, and thank you for that introduction. That was very nice of you. Way to set the bar high so I can only fail. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I actually work for Adobe Systems. I've worked there since 1992. Um, I used to be in tech support, so if you ever called and got the right answer, that was probably me. No, I'm kidding. Um, for the last 15 years, I've been able to travel around and really just talk about Lightroom and Photoshop and then um, hopefully provide some, some educational content and some inspirational content um, to photographers. And that's what I do. And just so you know, people, not only does she use Lightroom and is an expert in Lightroom and Photoshop and makes blur books, uh, we don't want to bludgeon you with the fact that this is a blurb webinar. We're going to describe a lot of things about Blur, but you're, you should use every platform you can get your hands on. But she is also a published author. She did this wonderful book called Window Seat. And for any of you out there who do a lot of traveling, I think you'll have a real appreciation for the book. So she's someone who edits and sequences and really knows how to, um, how to put books together. So thank you so much for joining us today. And um, let me just get started here. I want to bring up a presentation real quick. And uh, this presentation... For, I'm only going to I'm going to go through this really quickly. This is a long presentation, but for those of you out there, this port, this uh, webinar is clearly about portfolios, making portfolios, defining what they are, uh, and determining what's the best way to put this together. I worked as a photographer for a long time, and I just wanted to show you a brief synopsis of sort of the level of intensity, if you will, as to what photographers have to go through when it comes to making a portfolio. Because the simple fact of the matter is. You have to tailor your portfolios towards the audience that you're going to show them to. So I just wanted to give you a sample. Back in the day, I did a project. I spent four or five years working on this project. And when I got done with it, 
Uh, I showed it to a couple of friends that I respected and they said, look, this is a good project. This is good work. You should put this together and do something with it. So I created a portfolio and the first portfolio at the time was a page of slides that looked just like this. This is how people were doing portfolios at the time. Now today this looks archaic, but at the time we thought this was cutting edge. So bear with us. So this was the first portfolio I ever made from the body of work. Then I got an inkjet printer and I made a second portfolio, which was 13 by 19 prints. Many of you have inkjet printers out there, so you can make a portfolio like this. But that really wasn't enough. These were nice big prints and they were beautiful, but it wasn't enough. So I ended up making a third portfolio, which was another inkjet portfolio, but five by seven. We're gonna to speak to this more later, but the five by seven allowed me, and look, that tells you how old this is. Look at that iPhone. That's like a three or four, some archaic brick. But this was a portfolio I could carry with me. Big difference. My photographer brain told me to make the 13 by 19, but my realistic brain said, you gotta make something smaller. So I made a little five by seven portfolio. That was not enough. So I ended up making an eight by eight square. This was not with Blurb, this was from another company. And I made a book and I did a little writing and this was more of like a portfolio that was devol devolving into a storybook. Then I realized I should make something inexpensive that I could leave behind. So now I'm five portfolios from the same work. This was a very inexpensive, like Kinko's printed leave behind that I could give to clients that I really liked. Then I started to refine the book. And now, now I'm on to blurb here. This is the sixth portfolio from the same project. Very simple, uh, single images. Then came the portfolios that were created because magazines started to run the work. So now I had six different books that I made, and now I had an editorial spread that I could then tear out, laminate. This became a portfolio from the project. And then another camera arts magazine ran the story. So now that's eight portfolios. And nine, I was asked by a gallery to, to create a catalog. So I created a catalog of the work. So now I've got nine different portfolios. And just for fun, I threw in a 10th portfolio which was once I got into the gallery world, I realized that gallery collectors or photographer, photography collectors preferred silver gelatin prints over inkjet. So I went in the dark room and I printed the entire story in 11 by 14 silver gelatin for my 10th portfolio from the same work. So that just, I just am showing you this to show you how selective and how specific you can be. Uh, Let's see, and I'm just gonna shut this off now. How specific and selective you can be. Hang on, hang on. Trying to, uh, for some reason, it's not allowing me. Are you sure you want to stop? There we go. So I just wanted to blaze through that quickly because I just wanted you to see an example of one person and how selective you can be with the portfolios you're gonna make. So now we're gonna talk about all the modern tools and techniques. The first thing let's talk about Julianne is um, refining your story for your portfolio by selecting the right images, sequencing, et cetera. What do you, what's your take on, on that before you even get to making the portfolio? Well, okay. So I think I actually have a question for you with, with what you just showed us. Um, are you saying then that you made each one of those portfolios for a different audience? Like you really streamlined them based on yes. who you were giving them to? I did because I realized that every single person that you're showing a portfolio to is going to be coming from the angle in which they need something from you. So an editorial, let's say a magazine editor might need you to be a photojournalist while a commercial or an advertising rep is going to need you to make advertising photographs. Those are very different people and they're going to be looking for very different kinds of work. So yeah, I would tailor all of my portfolios to specific uh, target audiences. I think I think if someone was going to take just one thing away from this today, I think that's what that's what it I would hope it would be is that you you really need to know because if you're I mean there's people who create portfolios for themselves right so every year I I make a book um, which we'll call a portfolio you're going to get into what the difference is later but I do this just so that I can review the body of work that I've made over the past year because. For me, it really helps me to see the relationship between images that I'm making, um, maybe helps me connect different bodies of work together. It just sees similar things that are happening and trends. And maybe even if I'm a little introspective, I could say, well, how was I feeling when I took that photograph? And are there things that I can do to put myself in a better place when I make that photograph? But that all goes to say that those are, photo those are portfolios for me. 
not for someone else. Now, when I make a portfolio for someone else, like you said, the key ingredient is what do they want to see? It, it has, you kind of have to take yourself out of it a little bit. And as we were talking earlier today, you had mentioned that you had gone and asked advice from other people. And I think that's the best thing you can do is to find someone in the industry. So did you, did you want to give your example of that? Sure. Yeah. I think, um, so you and I spoke about this before, but, and before I go one step further, I just want to make sure some people were having some issues with the sound and I want to make sure that everybody's okay. Technically Kayla from blurb, the blurb mothership posted a link in case anyone is having, uh, technical difficulties. And also, uh, remember that everything that we're doing and talking about today will be archived on our YouTube channel. So if you miss it today or you're having a technical issue, you can come back to it. Uh, and so, okay, everyone's saying all good here. So re refresh my memory. What was the question you just asked me eight seconds ago? Oh, so, so you were talking earlier about the fact that as you were putting together a book, it was really helpful to have an outsider's perspective who knew that industry really well, because, you know, we get so attached to our own work that sometimes it's really hard we're like, but that image was so hard to make. I have to include it. And someone else is like, well, we don't care how hard it was to make. We want to know. Yeah, so I thought I had my act together. I thought I knew everything about my work. <clears throat> I thought I knew what the best images were. I thought I knew what portfolio I needed. And I turns out I knew nothing. So I went to photojournalism school. I studied photojournalism. And my goal in life was to be a magazine photographer. And so I would shoot and edit and sequence and create portfolios to try to get magazine work. And then one day, sort of accidentally, I showed work to someone who was an advertising rep. And the advertising rep went through my work and said, if I was making a portfolio for you, these are the images that I would include. And I looked at her and I said, you're, you're crazy. Those are not my best images. And she said, I don't care if they're your best images, but what they are are your best images for advertising clients. You've never worked for an advertising client. You have no idea what they're looking for. This is what they want to see. And I, it, it stuck with me forever. It really turned my head inside out about my own work. And then as I was still like suffering through this idea that I didn't really understand my own work, a gallery owner in LA did the exact same thing to me. I, I laid out five different full photo stories, photo essays, and she went through the whole thing and chose five images total from all of the stories and said, those are your best images. And I said, no, 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 you, you've made a mistake. Those are all from different stories. And she goes, I don't care. You can't see what I see. And these are all connected for this one reason. And again, I had to take a step back and say, oh my God, I, didn't, I never saw that. So yes, I think getting a second opinion on your work, because like you said, we fall in love with these images and we can't see beyond our own point of view. And it, it might not always be you know, really possible to get that second opinion for everything. So I think it's just, also really important when you when you know who you're editing for or the subject matter that you're editing for or the message that you're trying to get across or even if it's just your own long form story that you're putting together if you know the end result that you want if you can establish that and then work backwards you're going to save yourself a lot of time in editing because you're actually editing for something right so a lot of times i see photographers they go out let's say you you travel to iceland and you take you know 5000 images there and you start going through and you start editing those photographs. But if you don't know what you're editing the photographs for, it's really difficult. I think you're going to waste a lot of time because if, if I was just looking for the top 10 images that I wanted to have printed and have an exhibition or something, that's a very different edit from if I'm going to lay out a book because a book, I have to pay attention to the sequence of the images. I need to decide, oh, right, are they just going to be my hero images, the best images? Or do I need some supporting images? Like think like maybe like a wedding where you have you know, the bride and groom, but then you have detail shots. And so that's a very different edit from just your best work. So having that end in mind, I think is really important. So I'm going to take a step back here and ask what, what kinds of people actually need a portfolio? So let's take you and I, for example, I work as creative evangelist for Blurb. I don't work as a photographer anymore, but yet I still, have a portfolio series that I do. You work for Adobe. So do you need a portfolio? And you said that you edit your work every year to sort of give you that challenge of putting together a portfolio of best of the year. But who, I mean, a photographer who's trying to get work is a photographer, yes, they need a portfolio. But who else do you think qualifies for, do I need a portfolio or not? Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody needs a portfolio and they need portfolios for different things, I think, whether it's, whether it's personal. 
So when I think of a, a portfolio and we're thinking of, of a, a book, it's, it's like we were talking earlier about how it takes some effort to finish the project. But for me, even if I'm just giving myself a small assignment, I need to have a goal. I need to, at the end of the day, I want to feel like I've accomplished something. And I also want to kind of prove to anyone out there that I will go that extra step. So I'm going to see that project to fruition. I'm going to make that publication. I want something physical if that's what the person wants, right? Like, so there's, and I, I've never had anyone turn down like a portfolio book when I was giving it to them. I'm, I'm certain I've sent PDFs that people have never opened, but when you actually physically give them a book, it, it's really quite something different. And I think they, there's automatically a level of professionalism that they see because you have actually finished the project. I'm going to, I'm going to stop you because you said something really important and, and it was a trick question. What kinds of people should do a portfolio or who needs a portfolio? I agree with you. I think anybody who's serious about, let's just take photography, uh, outside of all the other creative things, illustration, design, whatever, everybody uses portfolios. But photographers, you said something and used the word fruition. Something came to fruition. And that is so important because inevitably, if you make a portfolio, if you're serious about photography, you want to become a photographer, you are probably at some point in time going to end up at something called a portfolio review. And let me just give you the audience a heads up here as to what actually happens at these things. So you go and you typically get a 20 minute session with one, with, a, with someone who you want to see your work. Could be an art buyer, uh, uh, an agent, an editor, et cetera. You get typically 20 minutes is the maximum amount of time. Oftentimes it's even shorter. So you've got to make up an impression really fast. There is a huge difference between walking up to somebody with an iPad and walking up to someone with a physical portfolio. So it has nothing to do with the quality of the work. It has everything to do with the word that Julianne just used, which is fruition, which is encapsulating that she went that one step further to edit, sequence, and print because the print signifies that you put enough critical thought towards the work that you're printing it for a very specific reason and there's a cost involved. So when I see, if I review portfolios, which I do once or twice a year now, and I see someone walking towards me with an iPad, my first thought typically is I almost guarantee they didn't edit very well because there's no penalty for leaving images in a gallery that you swipe through. But when someone walks up with a box of prints or a book, I may or may not like the work, but I at least look at it and I say, man, these, they took the time to edit, sequence, did the software, chose a paper type, chose a cover image, did a typography. They put their, their homework in. I think it makes a huge difference. And when someone asks me, you know, like, oh, well, you know, how much did that cost you? Or, you know, I just think um, it didn't cost me anything. It was an investment in my work. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Did everyone hear that? That was a great line. I mean, it, because sometimes I have a hard time like, oh my gosh, you know, am I going to pay X number of dollars to get this published? Is it worth it? Yeah, it's an investment in my work. I love that. Blurb loves that. Um, I'm, I'm going to stop and take this question because it pertains to the next uh, question that I was going to go over, which is I get a lot of questions about what's the, what makes a portfolio a portfolio? Why is it different from a book? And typically, and Sam asked this question, which it said, in Dan's sample portfolios, I noticed quite a bit of text. Is a, is a narrative important, important when designing a portfolio? Sam, that's a great question. Uh, typically, how I would describe the difference between a book and a portfolio is that a portfolio is simply uh, a taste of your very best work. It doesn't necessarily tell a story. You're just trying to demonstrate your mastery of a certain skill or another. So I'm a photographer. These are 10 of the best images that I've ever done, et cetera. That might, those 10 images, like Julianne said, are your hero images. They may not tell a story. A book typically includes a narrative arc, and the narrative arc could include copy, and it could include what we refer to as a transitional image or an informational image that might not be beautiful, but it might be critical for the viewer to see and pull information from so that they can t continue on the narrative arc. However, not to confuse everyone, but I kind of want to confuse everyone, is that we live in a very different world today. We live in a world where we have exponentially more photographers than we've ever had. And it's harder to stand out than it ever has been before. One of the reasons and one of the ways that you as an individual photographer will stand out is you as a human being. 
Who are you? What do you like? What do you believe? What are you interested in? What are you outside of being a photographer? These are things that you can now sort of weave into a portfolio that not only shows your best work, but shows that you're an interesting person to be around. Because a lot of clients are looking at your work and they're saying, okay, if Julianne's a good photographer and Dan's a good photographer, but Julianne is a really interesting person with a great sense of humor. And Dan, we don't know anything about, we just know that his images are okay. I can almost guarantee you she's going to get the job because clients want to be around interesting people. They want to be around nice people, people that are good with clients, et cetera. Would you agree with that? I would. And I'm, I'm also seeing the, the how specific and focused should a portfolio be in terms of genres. Um, I think incredibly specific. So I think not only should your, your edit needs to be super tight and super clean, it needs to be super focused on who you're presenting it to. Um, like Alan's mentioning there, that being an architect, when when he submits a portfolio, it's for a specific client. Yep. And, and that's what you're doing. I mean, if, if I was going to pass along my portfolio, you know, to a commercial entity, I'm not going to include a bunch of landscape stuff. Just, it's very similar to, to a portfolio online. I mean, you want that, I'd split it into two portfolios, right? Like I don't want all my commercial clients seeing my landscape stuff or, you know, I don't confuse the two on Instagram either. I have a very specific look and feel so that when people follow me, they're following me for a reason. I don't need a million followers. I want the followers who are going to appreciate and are interested in my work. And especially if I'm doing things, you know, for money as a job, I want to make sure that those are the ones that I engage in. So I would rather have something be super tight and super focused. Yeah. And just to take that even one step further, uh, let's say that we're going to talk a little bit more here in a second about having multiple portfolios, but to Julianne's point, let's say that Julianne is a, is a magazine editor and I show work to her and I walk up to her and I have my giant portfolio book and she looks at the portfolio book and she says, wow, that's great. And we have a good conversation and we, I, I take something from it. She takes something from it. I can literally go home and I can look at the notes that I took during my meeting with her specifically, and I can design a small, soft cover, inexpensive portfolio. I can take the key image from the conversation that she and I, maybe we bonded over one particular image. I can make a portfolio book with that image on the cover and then send that as a thank you for her taking the time to review my work. That is how specific I would be if I was sending portfolios out today. I would. That is the level of relationship that I want. I don't want a passing, you know, send out to 5,000 people and hope that something is going to stick. I want those relationships and that's what your portfolio should reflect as well. Also to Alan's point, uh, this is pretty interesting because it's a multi-point question here. It's an architect submitted portfolio was directed at a particular client. When I make a vacation book, it's static. It was an event. Um, there was another question, maybe Alan, you were the one who sent the question in ahead of time, but it was, could you adapt a portfolio book to, uh, from an event or vacation book? And I think the answer is yes. And, and there's a couple, I'm going to throw out these three things about a portfolio, these three words, which I'm going to harp on until everyone is sick of hearing me say this. I got to get my directional hand movement here. Humor, honesty, authenticity. If you utilize one or any or all of those, uh, there will be a great appreciation for the people on the receiving end of those books. So a vacation, I've seen, look at, let, let's take Martin Parr, the Magnum photographer, for example. He doesn't do vacation uh, photo books, but he makes a style of image that reflects people, in some cases, on vacation. It's considered He's considered one of the most important documentary photographers of the modern era. He's considered one of the most important bookmakers of the modern era. And yet his work oftentimes reflects the absurdity of cultures around the world when we're in places in vacation spots and we're on vacation. So absolutely, you could make a book from an event or a vacation and make a successful portfolio from it. All right, we are moving on to another question here, which is where we get really interesting. So what do you think... We've, talk, we've already talked about this in general, but um, I think we're going to switch and talk a little bit more about um, materials, which is the importance of having multiple portfolios. And I think, for, I, I think absolutely, yes. I mean, we've talked about having 
specifics, but also what do you think about materials? For example, if I ask you to describe the blurb portfolios that you've made, is there a consistency to the size, of the materials, or is it all over the place? For me personally, it's all over the place because it depends on who it's for, right? So um, I, I do have a, a particular style. Like I, I, I like the hard cover books and I like the more expensive paper. That's just, it. just to me, it, it makes the book feel better. It's a little bit thicker. It's a little bit nicer um, print. And uh, so I am rather consistent there as far as if I'm going to put all this effort into it, I'm going to invest in, in, you know, I'd rather send out fewer portfolios to very specific people, like you were saying, than just make a blanket kind of bland one and just send that out. So I really appreciate that you can, you know, whether you're using Book Riot or you're using Lightroom to design your book, both of those have all the different options for the magazine or the, the hardcover or the wrap or the soft cover. So I agree, and I think having multiple portfolios is, is, frankly, at this point, just about the only way to go. Um, however, there is, there is a weird twist on this. And so a lot of times I'll see photographers making books, and especially people who are new to the book, and they will try to pull something off, which I consider to be the masterpiece of all masterpieces, which is, let's, let's, think, let's think of it as a, mid, a career retrospective. Imagine going back to every project you've ever done, and editing a, a single portfolio from everything you've done and trying to make sense of that in a concise, you know, fine-tuned thing. That is, that is the masterpiece of all masterpieces if you can pull that off. I think it's incredibly difficult. It's very rare that I see anyone pull that off well. And so having themed portfolios, like for example, to your point, I, at one point in my photo career, I was both a wedding photographer and a documentary editorial photographer. And another photographer who's much better than I called me and said, I have a client and I really want to refer this client to you, but if they see weddings on your website, there's no way that they're ever going to hire you. You cannot tell them you photograph weddings. You don't want anything to do with it. You need to create a separate portfolio that's completely of your editorial work only. And that always stuck with me. Now, to the material point, to what you made, is in photography school, they taught us, you know, if you're going to make a portfolio, it has to look like X, Y, and Z. And you've got to use like all the greatest, biggest, what's the largest trim size and the largest page count and all that stuff. So I still love a beautiful, big book. I looked at a Peru book I did, uh, lay flat Peru book I did. And yeah, it's my own work. So of course I'm in love with all the pictures, but I saw that yesterday in my house and I was like, wow, that's such a, it's 12 by 12, it's thick, it's gorgeous. However, at the same time, my latest portfolio series is magazine. And I, what I do is I publish this in two sizes, a six by nine trade book, sorry, I'm six by nine trade book and eight and a half by 11 magazine. It's both the exact same content, so it's the same images on the same same layouts and everything at the exact same price point. It's like $10 each, but it's somewhat informal. And I found that I equate it to this. You go on vacation, right? We, we take vacation. Do you ever go to on vacation where you're sitting next to a pool? Sure. Okay. No, I don't really sit very well. <laughs> I, I mean, you're, hypothetically, play along. You're, you're on vacation. You're in uh, you know, Mexico. You go to vacation. You're sitting by the pool. I have never in my life ever seen anyone read a photo book next to a pool on vacation, especially a big coffee table photo book. But what okay. I've seen numerous times are people reading magazines. And so that, to me, is the benefit of having multiple portfolios with Uh-oh, I think you're frozen. Hmm. Okay, well, I think that perhaps I'm not frozen, so maybe I will start in from there. Um, so with a multiple portfolio, so let me just start answering a few of the questions. Um, so if I was just beginning to make a book and I didn't have a specific audience or person in mind, um, that would just be really difficult. Again, I would try to work backwards. So, um, and I would try to pull some kind of common thread so that 
and because and there was another question about how many images in the portfolio. And I have to say that you have to know the attention span of the person that you're going to send the book to, right? Because the attention spans are getting quite short these days. And so I would recommend that it, it really depends, but if they are going to sit there and they're going to look through something, you know, how, how much time do they really have? Are they going to spend more than five minutes? Can you imagine them doing that in a day? In which case it better be really, really a tight edit. I would say less is more. The one thing that you really don't want to have, you don't want to have something in your portfolio, like a photograph where they turn the page and it's just kind of, mm. you know, so anything that is not your best, most brilliant image, I, I wouldn't include it at all because I don't want, I don't want any mediocre images. It's, I would rather have fewer images than add something that isn't my best work. Um, I think one of the things that stops a lot of, a lot of photographers and a lot of artists from putting together the book, well, it stops me. So I don't know, I'm not speaking for everyone, but is just the thought that I have to write a lot. So that just kills me. I'm not a very good writer. And so that's why I prefer doing a portfolio as opposed to a book like Daniel was mentioning with, that has like a stronger narrative all the way through. Yes, I might put a caption under an image just to identify, maybe um, just for informational purposes, but I'm not going to write a complete narrative. I might put something in the very beginning to set the expectation, um, more like a, an artist statement, but for me, maybe, uh, well, it depends on who you're sending it to. It might be a little bit more casual. It might be a little bit more, um, it just depends on who, who you're, you're sending it to. So I might put a block of text at the beginning and then let the images speak for themselves um, as, we, as we work through the portfolio. So Julianne, would you please talk about the look of your images in the portfolio? Ah, uh, yeah, so um, I'm gonna go with, with a consistent look. I think that unless you can divide up the portfolio some way that makes sense, as if they're little chapters, um, I think you really want a common thread and a common look and feel. Because if you're using this portfolio to send to someone, if you make it specific to them, first of all, you're not wasting their time looking at stuff that they're not gonna be interested in. And two, they really wanna see your style and your look. The only way I can think to kind of break that up would be by actually having little chapters in your portfolio book. And I'm, I'm not really sure that if I was going to send this to someone to try to get employment or to be represented in a gallery that I would necessarily do that. I would want to be more focused for them. But let's say I'm making something just for myself at the end of the year and I want to see what it is that I photographed and try to pull these images together. Then I might break it up by location. I might break it up by subject matter. Um, because if I was a portrait photographer, I might take portraits, you know, the location might not matter. It might be um, the mood or the treatment of them, or I might have a black and white area in the portfolio and a color area of the portfolio. But again, that's, that's something that I'm making for me, not necessarily something that I'm going to send out and target someone else. Um, okay, let me just see. He's trying to rejoin. Have I ever made a book book? black and white and color. So I would say, hi, welcome back. Um, I would say that I have made a book that included both black and white and color, but it was very difficult. Um, I don't think it's the best book that I've ever made because I think that one of the things that's really important is that, that a book has a rhythm as you flip through it. I mean, that's the beauty of a book, right? Like I don't want to just put all my images up on Facebook because then they're just random and, you know, there's ads around them and everything. So you're making your portfolio and that portfolio, as the person walks through it, you know, you don't want all the photos to, to punch you in the face, right? You might want one that's like, there's your hero image. And then the next two kind of move you through. It's like, there's got to be this commonality. There's got to be this thread that's tying together each one of your images. And you can do that with color. You can do it with leading lines. You can do it with subject matter. There's a ton of different ways to lead the viewer through the book, but that's the best part about the book is that you're able to actually sequence all those images because yes, sometimes people pick up a book and they flip to a certain location like a magazine because you would be flipping to an article. But if it's all one article, if it's all one long story, 
you know, um, publication, most people don't just go to the center and then go backwards, right? Like they're going to start at the beginning. And so you can take them through. And that's the beauty of it for me is you can just lead them right through how you want them to, to see your images. I'm back. Back to you. Here. It was totally on my end, by the way, the internet, uh, the channel I was on here uh, just went away. Now we're back. So I don't know if you if you spoke to this, but okay. Jim in uh, Rockland, Maine, wrote in and said uh, they're they're going to remember you by your best or your worst image. And I think that that's Jim. That speaks to getting a second opinion because we fall in love with specific images. Or to Julianne's point, you said, "Oh my God, I worked so hard to make that image. It has to end up in my portfolio." And ten people in a row look at it and say it's not very good. They can't. They don't know the effort you put in. They don't know what it sounded like. They don't know what it smelled like. They weren't there. And so you have to get a second opinion. Um, just to give you a yeah. Can I jump in for one other thing? And that is um, time is such a fabulous editor for me personally. Now, other people, no. But like a lot of times my Instagram is not Insta. Because I would publish stuff that just isn't that great. But it was it was such a great experience. It's so hard to to remove the experience that you had when you made a photograph and the actual photograph and how the viewer is going to interpret the photograph. So I will, I like to live for my, with my images for a while. I'll tell you, if I didn't, when I come back from a trip, my book would like, be like 300 pages long. I'll tell you, you give it three months and my book is maybe a third of that, probably less than that, because all of a sudden I'm like, wow, that either the image doesn't go in the flow, like I couldn't weave it in somewhere so it doesn't make sense, so it would stick out and kind of be jolting, or it just wasn't as good of an image as I thought it was. It didn't and and well. time can also work in a different way, which is like say, for example, the work that the, the, the Nine Lives presentation that I gave at the very beginning, which was about a body of work in Sicily. When I did that work and I finished it, I was in a rush. I, was, I always felt like I was in a hurry. And I put this catalog and this book and this, all these portfolios together with about the same 45 pictures. And then the, that, that life cycle of that story sort of tapered off. And I moved on with my life and I did other projects. About three years went by and I went back to the negatives and I started taking my time and going through the negatives. And I realized how much I had left on the table. I had moved too quickly. I was too rushed. I just didn't give it enough time. I didn't live with the work and it cost me because there was a lot, there were a lot of images in there that should have been in the original 45 that weren't. And so I never really fully even took advantage of that, of that project. Uh, oh, just to, I'm going to answer this before we go on to the next, the next uh, main point here. But Sam asked again, if there were any other additional resources for learning about portfolios, I have one that, um, that I like. Do you have any off the top of your head that you would resources for portfolios or would you recommend people just go look at work and at books? Well, there's, there's never any harm in looking at books and portfolios, obviously, but um, I will just say if, if anyone was really interested, this is kind of a selfless, like shameless promotion, but if, if you're more interested, if you thought like, oh my gosh, I thought this webinar, they were going to step me through how to make a book in Lightroom Classic, that is all up on my blog. So um that you know so if if you're feeling like oh my gosh i didn't want this bigger umbrella i wanted the nuts and bolts on how to do that those are they're all movies on my blog and my blog's just it's blogs adobe.com slash jcost jkost and there's a little area that says like videos training videos and and there's lightroom classic training videos so i just didn't want anyone thinking they're really good videos by the way and they're and they're always funny um the 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 one resource that i have that i think is really interesting is on Instagram and also there's a website involved. It's called a photoeditor.com. A as in letter A, photoeditor.com. Um, his name is Rob. I can't remember his last name. Haggard, I think is his last name. Anyway, he's a former photo editor and he posts something I want to say almost every single day on Instagram that are promos that he receives in the mail from working photographers. And it's fantastic because these are not necessarily classic portfolios that he's receiving. He's receiving printed promotional pieces, which I would classify as hyper small, hyper edited portfolios that give a client an idea of who you are very quickly. 
and they are so beautiful. There are so many talented photographers working and so many wonderful printed pieces that I have gotten so many ideas and just I just get a thrill of looking at these things. So photoeditor.com is a great resource. So let's talk a little bit about software. And I wanna break this down into three things for making portfolios. The first would be Blurb Bookwrite. And for those of you who don't know, Bookwrite is the, is the classic Blurb software. It's free, it's, cr it's cross-platform, it works on anything. It's a really good program. Even if you have design abilities, even if let's say that you use InDesign on a regular basis, you, you should still check out Bookwrite. There will be things about it you might find a little restricting, but it's a really good tool and it works for, for type, typography, good copy, uh, there's a lot of tools there and it's a great program that is basic. Now for those of you who have never used it before, it is like any other piece of software you've ever encountered in your life, which it, it takes a couple of trial runs, a little bit of experimenting. Don't get frustrated, just get, just get zen and Experiment, tinker, make something small. Make a small, inexpensive portfolio first before you make your grand opus. That would be my advice about Bookwrite. And Kayla is posting links to the Bookwrite downloads right here. Julianne, tell us a little about Lightroom and the portfolio ability. Okay, so Lightroom Classic. Just want to make that clear because um, there's the all-new Lightroom CC. We're not talking about that. We're talking about Lightroom Classic because um, it has the book module and the option I always use is to create a blurb book. Um, should I give some tips Do the tips. should we come back to it? Um, you want me to put your slide up? So, sure, yeah. So it just kind of lists the five things I thought that would be helpful um, and why I like using Lightroom Classic. So the tips for the book module. And the reason that I love it is because I'm already in Lightroom, right? So I, I already know how to organize my images, right? So the, I might have, you know, like I mentioned, 5,000 images in a folder, but I can then create very quickly a little collection of images and I can organize, you know, that subset. So I have collections of images for all sorts of things, right? So I would make a collection of, of images for whatever I decide my portfolio book is going to be or my magazine or my trade book, whatever it's going to be. So I make my little collection and then from there I can go into survey mode, right? So I can select all my images, bring them all up at once and look at them all. And, and I can just, because they're in a collection, there's, there's no you know, subfolders or anything because they're virtual collections. So that means you can drag everything around. You can create your own custom sort order. And so these are all things, they're all tools that, that I'm really already using um, to create kind of that sort order that creates the rhythm of the book. And you can add more photos to your collection at any time, even after you go to the book module. So anyway, so I'm organizing and sequencing my images. Then I'm also entering metadata. So if you're taking the time to enter titles or captions or anything, do that in the library module in Lightroom. Because if you do it there, that metadata is part of the file. So when you move over to the book module, all that metadata will come across. And in fact, there's preferences. There's in the book module itself, there are book module preferences that just say, hey, when you create this book, pull over the caption or the title and add that as the photo text. So you can also add book text, right? So you might want some text that's specific to the book and you don't want to include it in the actual images themselves. You can do that as well, but it's just really nice to be able to just enter that information in once because I only want to title and caption my images once. So it's nice that the book module can just pull that in. Um, the other thing that I really love is because you're staying in Lightroom, if you're, was, I can't tell you how many times like you go to make a double page spread um, and then you realize like you need a smaller image up there and you really hadn't counted on that. Or maybe you're make, you, you end up with a diptych, you end up with two images on one page and all of a sudden they looked fine, you know, in the library module, but you realize they're not going to work on the same page. They're just not toned. The white balance is off. The amount of contrast is off. There's something wrong. So you just pop over the develop module. You can make your changes. And when you go back to the book module, it's automatically synchronized. So that to me makes it really worth my time, especially because you know a lot of people don't know in the in the develop module in Lightroom, there's something called reference view where you can um, set any image in your film strip uh, to be the reference. And then you go into reference view, which is just, well, it's 
um, shift R. I'm not, yeah, I'm not really sure. Sorry. Go into reference view and a um, little mind hiccup right there. And uh, it'll show up on the left hand side and then you'll be able to actually interactively make changes to the image on the right hand side until you get them to match. And then some people will always ask me though, but wait, I don't want that because I use that same image for print or something. I don't want to adjust it. So just make a virtual copy of it, right? You still just have one, one actual original image on your hard drive, but now you have two thumbnails in Lightroom. You can include one of those thumbnails in the book project and another one in some other project where you don't want to make the changes to the image. And then um, the other thing that people don't know, because when we first came out with the book module, it wasn't customizable. We only had templates, but now you can add as many photo cells, they call them, or you can add as many different text cells. You can even overlap them and change the stacking order, although for me that gets a little bit busy. Um, but you can put them anywhere on the page. And if you don't want to do that and you just want to use a template, you should know that all those cells, if you have a cell that's this big, there's padding. So you can actually use the padding. You know, the padding doesn't have to be linked. It doesn't have to change on all sides. If you want to shift something over, just move the padding on one side or the other. So once you have a cell in the template, you can still rearrange the image within that cell. The other nice thing is that you don't have to crop all your images, right? Because if you have a cell, maybe you have a cell that's square, but obviously your original isn't square. You don't have to crop it to a square. You just plop it in the cell and then you can reposition it within that cell and you can zoom it and do all of that, which is nice. So you don't have to have like five versions of yeah. your images, all the different crops. Um, and then the text, the text capabilities, I really appreciate in Lightroom. You know, you have all your basics like alignment and learn and um, letting and tracking and kerning and all those things. You can save your presets. Um, you can make multiple columns. And um, I find that really handy too, because, you know, just as your photograph, you're making an impression with your photograph, you, type also speaks. Like type is an image as well. You have to think about that. You have to make sure that you match your font with the story that you're trying to tell. So you don't want, like, if you've got a really serious photojournalistic story, you're not going to use, um, you know, like some kind of script font that you would use maybe if you were doing a wedding. So just also just keep that in the back of your mind. And there's a great book called Stop Stealing Sheep and Find Out How Type Works. It's really, it's an old, it's, it's an old book, but it's a great book. And it just shows you the relationship between typographic characters and the inherent meaning that they have and which are better to use when you've got a headline versus a thick body of text and stuff. So, so that's my little so take on I that. I think, let me just stop this real quick. Jim said comics um, yeah, everywhere. For sure. Uh, Rodeo yeah. is also another favorite. I think to Julianne's point about Lightroom, this, this, to me, this applies to all software, but if it's, and the key, the word I'm going to use is efficiency. And to me, that's the beauty of Lightroom is that it's an efficient program because you don't have to leave it. You can, like she said, edit, tweak, all within the same ecosystem of the program. And I see, I've seen photographers do this for years, the people who are up until two o'clock in the morning every day, turning jobs and tweaking and editing. And I'm like, you, you can't do that. That's not a long-term solution. And, and I saw a book a couple of weeks ago that was done in Lightroom that blew my mind because I still look at Lightroom as a relatively streamlined bookmaking tool. But when I saw this book, I thought I have got to revisit this because I'm primarily a book write in design bookmaker. And speaking of InDesign, I just want to touch on this really briefly. We have about 10 minutes left and I want to get to some of the questions. InDesign is your other option for making a portfolio or any other kind of book in the Blurb ecosystem. There's an InDesign plugin that you can, that you can download. And I'll tell you, I'll, I'll give you a reference as to how good the InDesign plugin is. The InDesign plugin is so good that it allows people like me to use InDesign. So prior to having a plugin, I was terrified of InDesign because InDesign in essence is like staring at a blank canvas. And if you're sitting there with your acrylic paint and you have a completely blank canvas, that first brush stroke is incredibly intimidating because there's nobody telling you do that, do this. It is wide open. There's no templates. There's no nothing. You can get templates, but for the most part, having said that, once your design skills and your desire for things like complicated typography, rendering text, et cetera, 
those come into play. InDesign is a, a well that never runs dry. It's a really wonderful program. So for those of you skilled and who are using InDesign every day, just know that there is a plugin for it. It's on the Blurb website. It's free, downloads, boom. And what it does is the plugin will fabricate both the cover document and the body document for you to the exact specifications required. And if you make changes during the process, let's say you change a paper type or you add or subtract pages, it will compensate for that and will still print correctly. If I had to do those measurements on my own, it would never work and I would never use it. So the plugin was a, was a lifesaver to me. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes left and uh, Patricia asked, what was the name of her, oh, Stop Stealing Sheep. That's the name of the book. And also Kayla has posted the, uh, the link for the InDesign plugin for those of you who are looking for that. So I wanna kind of back up here for a second in the last few minutes that we have. And someone wrote in, a, there were two questions I wanted to address right off the bat. Whoever wrote this, I love you. This is my favorite question of the day, which is what is this all about? I'm so confused. It can be about anything. It's about life in general. We're gonna skip that question and go to the next one. Someone wrote in, a seemingly innocuous question that I think strikes at the heart of everything we're talking about today, which is how do I start? Because I know there's someone out there right now that's sitting and saying, Julianne, I have, I have 10,000 images in my Lightroom catalog. I've never made a portfolio. I've never edited my work. I don't know about the softwares. I, I feel intimidating. I don't know what to do. How do, how do I even begin to get this process going? Now, I have a couple of points that I would give. What, what, do, what do you think? What would be? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead with your points. I'll see. The first thing that I would do is say you can never lose track of the fact that this is supposed to be fun. If you're having fun in this process, we will continue. I don't like doing my taxes. I hate doing taxes. It's not fun. I hate it. I start dreading it months out, and I dread it all the way through. Even though it's a simple process, I hate it. It makes me miserable for the time. It makes me miserable. So that is what you want to avoid. What I would do is I would take a little notepad and a pen and I would sit down and I would write a question, which is, as a, who am I as a photographer? Am I a documentary photographer, am I a landscape photographer, am I a portrait photographer, or am I all the above? I would define who I am. And then I would go to my catalog of images and I would choose one thing. If I'm a landscape, but let's say that I think I'm a landscape photographer, I would just choose my landscape images. And I would give myself a, a number, a target number, let's say 20 or 25 photographs, which I think is a good area for a first, first portfolio. And that is the only thing I would go for. And I would look at my work in terms of themes, and I would say, I'm going to do a landscape portfolio. I'm going to do a portrait portfolio. And that way you're eliminating 90% of what else is in the catalog, just focusing on that one thing. And I would also make something book-wise, material-wise, that was relatively inexpensive so that I didn't, again, put this pressure on myself if I've never done this before. And I can, you know, you can make a $220 book if you want. That would be great. I would be happy. Blurb would be happy, I'm sure. But we want you to be happy as a bookmaker. So I would choose something relatively small. And I would also put borders on that. I would say I'm only going to give myself 30 pages. And I'm going to give myself this trim size and that's it. And I'll move forward. That would be my advice. I think I think you really nailed it on that. That no matter what it is, when people ask me, like you know, how do I learn Photoshop? How do I? Well, you don't you don't learn any software. Well, you can on deadline, but it's not very fun, right? So this whole concept of all right, I know that now I need to make these books for these specific audiences that I need to send them to, but the first one should just be for you. It should really just be for fun. It's got to be just a self assignment that you, you just, for me, I, I think I mentioned this earlier, I will always work backwards. So if you don't, if I don't put parameters on what it is that I'm going to create, I just, I'll never finish it. It's, it's like, it's like that saying that, you know, if you have a project, it will take all of the time that you will give it. Right, like if it's not due until Friday at three, I will be working on it Friday at three, but I probably could have turned it in on Tuesday at one because that's when I was really done. So it takes that deadline. So I'm just saying that if I if I were to say today, like I want to create my first book, yeah, I probably wouldn't pick the most expensive options because I'm hoping this is going to be a learning experience. 
I would definitely make it small because it is a learning experience. Um, I wouldn't be afraid to try different things. So I, I might not know like, well, how does a double page spread work? And a double page spread is just when you have one image that crosses over the gutter, right? So it's on both pages. And you're like, I don't know if I would ever want to do that. Try it. Like my first book that I would create, I would try a bunch of different templates and say, okay, so is six images per page too busy for me? Because how am I really going to know unless I try all those things? So it's, for me, again, it's not a waste of money to create this. It's an experiment and an investment in what you like. It's just like, it's like if you were going to have prints made somewhere, I, I wouldn't just wait till the last day where I have to submit them to the gallery and then I'm under all this pressure and my life's going to be miserable if I don't pick the right paper. I'm going to do all that little experimentation when there's no pressure and see if, if, because then I can figure out which ones yeah. I like and which ones I don't like. <clears throat> Another nice little safety valve that I found kind of by accident going way back. This is early, early days of my blurb life was uh, I realized, so m growing up, my mother was the family documentarian. My mother had a Pentax K1000 and a Halliburton case. In my entire lifetime, she shot Kodachrome slides. Of all my brother and sister and I growing up, we had tray after tray after tray of slides. When I got into photography, my mom came to me one day and basically said, I'm done, I'm out, it's on you to document the family. So I have nieces, nephews, brother, sister, mom, et cetera, and I make pictures. And a few years ago, I made a book about uh, for my mom, of my mom. And of course, it didn't matter how good the book was because my mom got it and she was like, didn't even, it didn't compute that like I did this book and the book was about her. She was so puzzled for a few minutes. But it's a family book. It's an incredibly forgiving kind of thing because it didn't matter how good the book was, my mom was gonna love it. Then I did a book on my nephew. Then I did a book on my nieces, et cetera. So I, what I was doing was eliminating all of the work that defined me as a professional photographer to the outside world. And I found a body of work that was really personal where there was no right or wrong. The audience was my family. They're the most forgiving audience in the world. And it made those books so much fun to make because I realized I was never going to be judged by any of this work. It was just, you know, who doesn't like looking at pictures of themselves in the family environment kind of thing. So that's another good way of sort of taking the pressure off is every professional photographer I know has a professional photo life and a private photo life. And oftentimes the best work that they make is made in their private photo life, believe it or not. And so that can be a nice little escape valve, even for those of you out there who were experienced making portfolios, you probably have a lot more portfolios in you that you might have not considered until now. So always a good, a good uh, choice. And like Julianne said, you can experiment, take chances on a personal portfolio as, as opposed to a professional one. All right. I also really like Florence's comments just about the watching the YouTube videos and finding a, a photography friend. Um, you know, there's, there's this, there's kind of two ways to look at it sometimes. I mean, sometimes you don't have time. And so you really are doing like what I'll consider is just in time learning, right? Like you just need the answer to a question and you need it right now. And YouTube is just lovely and magnificent for all things like that. Um, and I think if I can make an analogy to like a car, like, you know, I don't have a man. It's automatic, right? And I just want to go out and I want to get in my car and I want my car to work and I want it to get me to, to work, right? I just want it to work. But if I was a race car driver, I would need to know how the engine in that car works. So what I feel like, and what is always my goal, is that if I'm going to commit to doing something like making a book, and I know all this stuff takes time, but at the same time, I don't want to be, I don't want the tools to rule me. I want to rule the tools. So while I can go and just get the answer to one or two things, I really like to know how things work. And so for me, it's worth the investment to also look into um, like taking a class or something or, or working with someone who really knows the depth of the program because they're going to show you stuff and you're going to be like, well, I'm never going to use that. That was a waste of time. And then like six months down the road, it turns out that is exactly what you need. So there's, there's never a waste of time when someone really is showing you how to do something. Um, so I would just say to master your tools, regardless if it's your, your camera, if it's making a portfolio, whatever. Well, I think that's great advice. And I loved your analogy earlier about investing in yourself, the, the 
you're, you're you know investing in your portfolios, investing in you. So uh, we have come to the end of our time limit and our uh, our talk today already. That was fast. Uh, I want to apologize for my uh, my mini vacation in the middle due to the network I was on disappearing. It, I I don't think it had anything to do with me, but I can't guarantee that. But I just want to say thank you uh, so much for the people who have joined in. Again, it's going to be archived on YouTube. Thank you so much to Julianne for joining us today. And uh, we will be back again with more webinars. And, uh, and thanks again to everyone out there in webinar land. And thanks to Kayla in the office for, uh, for helping us maintain this thing. Thanks, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Go make portfolios. Go make those portfolios. <laughs>